sci-fi and fantasy short stories. The Schooner Red Wing by Andrew Kleinstuber Midnight, October 22, becomes 23, my birthday, 1891. There was nothing but fire left of the ship, scattered across the shore like cannon sabot, splintered and burning bright beneath the pouring rain. The explosion, which we'd later find out, was from the barrels of gunpowder in the hall and a lantern fire in the galley above, had torn through the night, sending concussions out into the darkness and hunks of scorched wood one hundred yards over the shore. It took nearly an hour for us to all regain our hearing, and even then I suffered from pronounced tinnitus and felt unsteady on my feet in the half-frozen, rain-scoured sand. We searched the beach under the glow of the fire for survivors, found only pieces. Six men in total, or what was left of them, were recovered from the wreckage by the time the early morning haze split the field of blue above us across the middle along the horizon the color of boiled welch. The remains were wrapped in canvas and stowed in the back of a wagon we'd borrowed from Mr. Stuart Cotton, the farmer who'd lent the oxen to help pull the Lyle gun in the night. His daughter was the first of the onlookers come the ashen morning light, drawn in to the tendrils of black smoke that blossomed into the clouds above. She stood there on a high dune to the north, and the wind tossed thick red curls into her face and a long green dress billowed around her ankles, steam pouring from each breath through her nostrils as she watched the aimless wandering of the six watermen from Station Indian River around what little remained of the wreck of the schooner Red Wing. By the time the sun had fully risen, though still smothered behind thick, milky white clouds, the crowd was nearly two score and beginning to murmur amongst themselves. Surfman Long brought us together around a small fire behind the charred corpses in the wagon. His normally bright and youthful eyes seemed gray and unfocused. His tight-cropped hair somehow must, and when he spoke, his voice was a shiver. There are no survivors. He seemed relented to admit this, as though it were his bearing that had brought the ship aground. Anyone lucky enough to survive the explosion wouldn't have survived the sea at night in these conditions. Her voice cut through the still air like a flag shifting in a gale. What about the footprints to the south? We all turned to the young Miss Cotton, standing with her hands buried deep in pockets and a slight shift in her neck. Long's voice found some traction before the lady. This doesn't concern you. And then he wavered. What footprints? Shifting her shoulders beneath her thick gray cloak, the young woman flicked her eyes to the southeast. Beyond the area you searched, surfman, there's an unsteady trail headed over the dunes. Looks like they were dragging something. Long's eyes were manic. His left brow jut high on his forehead in a sharp upward V, his mouth slightly ajar before he spoke. Beyond where? Dragging something. How can you... He broke off mid-sputter, turned with a hand to his hairline, and started across the now steaming wreckage with Surfman Cole following suit, leaving the rest of us standing around the fire looking at the young woman with the cold green eyes. She looked at each of us in turn, and when she found me, I felt a chill begin in my spine that trickled off into my marrow, put ice in my blood. Then she turned and started off toward the ox at the front of the wagon and whispered to them with her long fingers on the faces of the creatures. By now... The crowd in the dunes had somewhat dissipated. As quickly as the people flocked to the black smoke in the horizon, they vanish. Soon as the dead have been covered, the fun is gone. 
The subtle paradox of humanity is that we fear death, but, like a shark that smells blood in the water, it draws us in out of hunger for the unimaginable. Its presence excites in ways we can't begin to comprehend. So, after the bodies, still smoldering along the severed limbs and fringed hairlines, were wrapped tight in canvas, often so incompletely that a single man could manage the package with ease, and it was loaded into the wagon and covered by a sheet, there was nothing left to see but a pile of crippled planks that had once been a boat they couldn't care less about. So they left, save a few late arrivals hoping for their glimpse of fatality, the hunger grinding in the pit of their stomachs. Because of this, there were only a handful of spectators privy to the very public outburst from Surfman Long on the southern edge of the wreckage. There was a long and often startling line of profanities strewn out into the morning, followed by the unhinged croak, I see that, Surfman Cole! With everyone's eyes now on the spot fifty yards away where the tall man chastised his slightly bumbling compatriot, the cold breeze shifted just and sent the thick ocean air across the beach and long seemed to settle with the temperature drop. His shoulders slackened and fell toward the earth, and he gestured behind him toward the wagon where we stood. When he spoke, his voice was quiet, and the words were drowned out by the crash of waves and the fire crackling beside us. After a quick nod, Surfman Cole turned and trotted off back toward the group, his head stooped low. At the edge of the group, Cole stopped, breathing heavy, and spoke. Surfman Haley, Long would like you to accompany us. He wants you to br- Cole hesitated as he spoke, and his eyes flittered left where Miss Cotton now stood. Lowering his voice, he continued. He's asked that you bring the Winchester. The rest of you are to begin clearing debris from the shoreline. The words sent a rippled murmur around the group that landed, along with their gazes, on my brow as I peered into the fire. Without meaning to, my eyes shot up and at the woman by the wagon that she'd ridden to church in the previous Sunday, now filled with the charred remains of sailors, and saw what I thought to be hatred in her before I looked back to the fire. I nodded, barely a crick of the neck, and started off for the wagon. I removed my hunting rifle, a Winchester Model 1885 from the rear of the wagon and a box of ammunition from the canister beside and hung the weapon over my shoulder and set a handful of rounds in my pocket. I felt their weight bulging at my hip as I moved through the group, and I felt the stock of the rifle against my shoulder and the frozen air blowing off the sea as I followed Surfman Cole away from the fire. But more than anything... I felt her eyes on the back of my neck, watching. We followed the trail for several hundred yards as the sun began to tear its way through the veil of clouds overhead, and by the time we reached the clearing, we were under full light, exhausted and soaked through. At the top of a small dune, looking down into the small basin, we saw first a frenzy of black feathers and yellow eyes behind red scaly faces. A single shot from the Winchester fired from the hip was enough to scatter the flock, and we were left alone, staring into a pile of intangible flesh as their wings beat solemnly above, circling like wraiths. First, we thought it was another body, from the top of the pile reached fingers to the heavens, stiff with rigor, and below there were sordid outlines of legs and a torso, and at our feet, now two meters away, lay a single ear stripped of skin. Upon closer inspection, it became all too clear that the entirety of the pile was void of skin, a sinewy mess of gore. 
By the time I saw the third foot and realized this was not one man, but the missing pieces of the whole crew, Surfman Cole was vomiting in a dogwood bush. For a long moment, we stood, staring at the exposed muscle and tendons and bones stark white beneath the sun, before the flies found us, and we began a silent retreat back to the top of the dune. This... This is... Surfman Long seemed to start speaking as a matter of formality, as if he were still trying to decide what he could possibly say about this. This is witchcraft. His voice cracked as he finished speaking, and a burst of wind carried most of the words into the ether. But it was obvious from the sheen of his eyes and the droop of his shoulders that Surfman Long was lost. Cole stood doubled over still, with his back to the desecration, and in recollection, I believe he was in silent prayer. For several minutes we stood like this, alone together on the edge of sacrilege. The next moment was one that will likely define the entirety of my future existence on this planet, and in that moment, as I'm sure was the case with all moments of note, I don't know that the decision was made in real time. It were as if the whole of my life, the years spent stalking deer in the fall, with dried leaves at my feet and the thousands of rounds I'd sent down range in preparation for a war that never came, and the nights spent wide awake with the icy chill of darkness lapping at my feet, all led to that instant. It gave me the strength to swing the rifle around and expel the spent round from the chamber, lock a new one in its place. It gave me the will to turn away from the pile of rotting meat that was once men and grab hold of the lapel of my superior. It gave me the voice to growl in his ear, Send word of this to Vickers. Take coal, go back to the beach, and send word with the fastest horse in the stable of what has happened here today. And long. When he turned and looked into my eyes, all I saw was my own reflection, twinkling in reverse in his tears, and I almost didn't recognize the ferocity of myself. Don't look back. With a fistful of his shirt, I shoved him in the direction of Cole, and the two of them, still shaken with shock, started off toward the ocean. They didn't look back. When I was a boy, my father used to take me into the woods, often for days at a time. He was a small man, my father, and light on his feet, but his hands were tough as stones, and his arms were strong from the fields, and in those days, he taught me how to survive. He showed me the way to tell north by the growth of a tree line, the direction I was currently headed. He showed me the way to tell if an animal were injured by its tracks, a gait which I now followed in the wet sand. He showed me how to keep the wind from tossing your scent into the nostrils of your prey, something I was currently finding difficult in the open dunes, but I saw, with some relief, the tracks went toward the woods, not the sea. In the forest you find order, there are systems and networks blooming and interconnecting, and what works thrives, and what doesn't fails. But in the ocean, you find chaos, an eternal struggle for dominance in a fluid environment. This is why, my father used to tell me, man left the sea to find order. But as I gripped the wet stock of my rifle and pulled the butt into my shoulder, I knew otherwise. Man left the ocean for the same reason man does all things, for food and shelter. From the scenes which I had just left, I had to assume that the man, or beast, that I followed had the former and would like seek the latter. I dare not describe the visions that were skirting the edges of my imagination in the darkness just beyond thought, though I assure you with no manner of pride or arrogance that I was in mild states of panic, though I knew it were my duty 
as if it were fated so. Why had I been the only one allowed a rifle at the station? Why had I brought it along across the inlet in heavy seas? If it was not so, then it was likely nothing was. And to that, I'd continued still. Though as I continued, I felt myself happening on somewhat of a daunting realization. It was that, in an odd sort of sense, the man I followed seemed to be growing stronger rather than weaker. His gait grew steady, and his right footfall, which had been dramatically exaggerated, grew softer and even with the left. Watching the steps was like watching the steps of a man remembering how to walk. Before, had I been nervous or timid, I was at least hopeful my prey might be injured. Now, I was simply scared. And I confess, when I heard the sand shift and give way behind me and to the left, panic took control of my heart, and the tips of my fingers went numb as the blood poured from my extremities, and my finger slipped from the trigger over the guard in the wet air as I fell onto the sand and the barrel of my rifle shot toward the sky, and I felt for certain I would die without so much as a fight. I saw, much to my great overwhelming relief, that standing twenty feet away with a smirk on her lips was the young Miss Cotton, green eyes flashing in the midday sun. When she moved across the gully... Her long red hair caught the sun, and a sudden burst of vermilion erupted in the sterile afternoon light, and had she not left footprints behind with every step, I'd have sworn that she drifted rather than walked up to me, hand out. Didn't mean to sneak up on ya, but I didn't want to call out either. Her hand was strong in my own, and she pulled me forward, and I set the rifle around my back. Standing before her, I brushed the sand from my sides and saw her eyelids flutter my way before she looked back toward the trees. Not with that thing out there. For a brief moment, I found myself admiring the small freckles that had begun to fade from her summer skin, slight ashen cobwebs along her cheeks and nose. Then I, too, turned, followed her gaze. I suppose you saw, then? She turned, and her emerald stare found my own, and she looked what felt like damn near through me, and once more my blood ran cold. The abomination a mile back? A single look into her eyes told me that she had seen it, and yet she had continued, alone. Of all the things that tore through my mind, the only thing I could manage, it's witchcraft. For a moment, the young Miss Cotton seemed to consider her words, chose them carefully. It could be. Again, her gaze drifted back to the woods. What do you know about witchcraft? The words, even as they were spoken, felt someone else's, and immediately a damp fever broke across my brow in the cold air. Fortunately, Miss Cotton kept her gaze steady as my forehead paled and dried in the slight breeze. A slight smile on her lips as she spoke. Enough, I suppose, to know what it might look like. Not enough, however, to know what it doesn't look like for certain. When she turned and looked at me, she smiled openly, and her cheeks bore dimples and a defiant joy flashed through her eyes— and my stomach turned the way it had on the boat crossing the inlet, only this time with my feet planted firmly on dry land and the sun shining overhead, I was somehow less prepared. We followed the trail another half mile through what was first a thin pine grove and grew into a near impassable forest had it not taken us along route of a riverbed. Along the walk, aside from Miss Cotton's obvious determination in pursuit, I had learned that her name was Evangeline Cotton. She was a twenty-five-year-old mother of one, and as far as I could tell, she was well adept at traversing wilderness. Though her ethnicity and her accent bore the unmistakable Anglo-Saxon characteristics of the immigrant farmer, there were traces in her movements and slight habits and secrecy as she spoke— that she was lying about something. 
It was not, in light of recent events, at the top of my concerns as we walked, each step found, analyzed, and chosen before taken through a forest floor laden with pine needles and dried branches. At a fork in the river, we stopped for a moment. Miss Cotton drank from the water pooled at the junction. I watched as she collected the water in her hands and poured it into her mouth, droplets spilling down her wrists and throat. You know, Miss Cotton, I'd feel much better going about this on my own. She swallowed the water in several long gulps and wiped her chin with the back of her hand as she rose into the still forest, and she smiled at me with the same eyes she'd had for me over the fire beside her father's wagon. I'm coming with you. Yes, I started. You've expressed that opinion several times. You have not, however, given me even a single reason for such an unreasonable desire. She seemed to flirt with the idea of the truth, as if it were only ever but a passing fancy for her. Then she shrugged and turned back toward the trail. Doesn't your job end with the dunes? I started after her, careful not to molest the footprints before me. This isn't about duty anymore. I spoke faster than I could think, and through time, I couldn't believe I'd said that aloud. Of course not. Duty, honor, all that. She tossed a glance over her shoulder as if to suggest that I knew exactly what she meant by all that. Means nothing beyond staving off boredom and inner competition. How else do you get a group of men to live together and not start measuring? Tell them it's about honor. She snorted as she spoke and darted over a fallen tree along the shoreline. You're here because it's where you are. If you weren't here, you wouldn't be you. She stopped, turned to me as I caught up to her. And if I were anywhere else, I wouldn't be me. So I'm going, understand? There was an awful lot of Northern European in her vigor. And though I still wasn't sure that I could trust her, just off and over her shoulder, I saw smoke wafting from the top of a stone chimney. She turned and followed my gaze, and without warning, at sight of the smoke, took off in a low dart across the shallow river and through an overgrown holly bush without so much as a rustle. I took off at half speed, praying for silence. With my head low and shoulders high, I tore through the holly and high-stepped the tangled roots and felt the leaves tear at my chapped face and stick in my hair, and just as I thought I might be moving in circles, I broke through the other side and nearly collided with the back of Miss Cotton. She stood perfectly erect with her shoulders square, looking out over the small homestead under the pine. On the immediate left of the property was a beautiful stone house built by hand with a sturdy wood roof and a fire that burnt far too black out of the chimney, and windows and doors were thrown tight. The right side of view was taken up by a small horse stable built for four but only holding two, as well as a pair of goats, while a cock chased his flock out of view behind a sizable mound of hay piled just behind the extent of the corral. It was, excepting the livestock, quiet. When the scream tore out through the still fall afternoon, Miss Cotton was moving before I could register the sound, so instead of hoping to discern possible location, I simply took off in pursuit of my companion. The sound, torn and strained, was seemingly from a child and must have come from the inside of the home, for as we approached came a terribly shrill clattering sound, like the nasally grinding of rusty gears. I called out for Miss Cotton upon hearing the sound, but she proceeded forth without fear or hesitation, and I followed. The beast that was inside the household was one of symptomless horror. The shock that overtook our will as we stepped inside the building was unparalleled, save possibly, likely owing to which our safety was amounted, by the shock of the beast itself upon our sudden outburst into existence. Before us stood a perfectly constructed human puzzle formatted in three dimensions over what was some form of gelatinous being, as if the patchwork of human skin would camouflage the glistening coils of flesh beneath. On the creature's face, 
set an entire face-cut mask, though three extra eye holes had been torn through the forehead of Sailor Number 4. From where we stood at the doorway, we had a full view of the beast crouching awkwardly in the center of the room amidst a pool of its own discharge, with a broken armoire splintered at the base of a dented bedroom door from which the sound of crying children could be heard. Within the span of five seconds, three things happened. First, my Winchester jammed as I pulled the trigger, targeted on the center of the chest quilt. Second, Miss Cotton removed two Colt revolvers from inside her cloak and squared them at the beast. And third, the beast let out a horrid, piercing cry that felt to have torn clean through my eardrums, and had it not been for the extended expulsion of bullets from the steady tips of Miss Cotton's revolvers, then I'd have sworn I'd gone deaf from the cry. Tips of her barrels still wafting tendrils of smoke, Miss Cotton watched the beast drop to its knees and fall flat on the stone floor, a thick, black blood pooling around its corpse. In a single fluid motion, she slung both pistols back and over her thumbs and let them drop simultaneously into the holsters she'd concealed beneath the thick wool. She turned on her heels and started off for the door with quick and certain steps, stopping when she was square with me. In a moment that felt like it happened without there being time to react, but seemed to drag on for a near eternity, she shot up on her tiptoes and kissed my cheek her sharp, jutted nose bobbing my eye socket as she did so before dropping back to her heels. Hey, Surfman. I managed to turn and look at her. You sure you know how to use that thing? She nodded in the direction of my Winchester, and as I looked down at the rifle in my hands, she slipped out the door, and the father of the small family began a slow exit, his bloodshot eye peering through a sliver of light between the door and frame. The bodies of the six surfmen were laid to rest in the Ocean View Presbyterian Church tonight, the night of October 27th, 1891. The names John Johnson and Francis Mullen were managed by the shipping company as crewmen on board, though there was no way of knowing which parts belonged to which man, so effectively they were all unmarked graves. A seventh hole was dug and filled with the remains of the beast, though concrete was filled in on this particular plot, as per request of the reverend. The six surfmen from Station Indian River were present to pay our respects, along with our keeper, Washington Vickers, a team of analysts from D.C. here to check the hall of the Red Wing, and the chief of police, his deputy, a few local mourners, and, somewhat to my surprise, Mr. Stuart Cotton. As they tossed the first handful of dirt onto the grave that was filled with concrete, I made my way around the thin crowd to where the farmer stood in his Sunday best and extended my hand in greeting. Mr. Cotton, my name is Francis Haley. We shook hands, and the big man grunted his greeting before looking back off toward the seven holes in the lush earth. Some shite, isn't it? I nodded in silence, seeking the proper wording. Your daughter mentioned what happened then. He turned slow, and his eyes bore the unmistakable coldness of confusion as he searched my gaze. Eventually, he shifted his stance and made to start off back towards his wagon. I don't have a daughter, Surfman Haley. I stood in the still fall air, and watched the farmer walking off toward his land to the north, with the ceremonies concluding behind me and the sound of shovels piling dirt onto the earth on top of the sailors from the schooner Red Wing and the beast that rattled my fall. I turned back to the man and caught the quiet blue eye of Washington Vickers twinkling in the sunlight, and he winked before grabbing a spade of his own, piling dirt on the past. Andrew is an award-winning fiction writer from Delaware, where he owns and operates a small farm with his wife. His free time is spent as close to the water as possible, 
with a book in his hand, or writing stories that nobody wants to read. Hey guys, I hope you liked that story. So, when Andrew Kleinstuber sent this to me, he mentioned that he's a historical tour guide at the Indian River Lifesaving Station, and he does reenactments of some of the things that have happened there. When he told me that this is very loosely based off of real events, including even the fact that there's an unmarked grave in the local cemetery, I thought that was really cool. I've had a couple of stories on the channel where people have taken historical events and then twisted them into something fantastical, but historical fiction doesn't tend to be one of the things that get submitted very often. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a comment if you're on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast, just be sure to subscribe for more brand new short stories. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.